ahead, Steve, whenever you'd like. Okay, cool. Then that'll work. I wasn't sure if you were going to do an introduction or not. So not a problem at all. Um, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, sorry about the technical uh, challenges. It kind of fits our our talk for tonight um, about some of the uh, mishaps management and mayhem that we have in the beekeeping world. And despite the title, uh, it may sound amusing, uh, but ultimately this talk is kind of more on a serious note of some of the things that we deal with as beekeepers that we tend to forget about or we kind of lose focus on. Um, ultimately, you know, as, as we know with beekeeping, there's a long, steep learning curve. And we, we come across some challenges in management and some chaos and some mishaps and whatnot. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, ultimately, I like to start off with a lot of my talks with this quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson that says, uh, as to methods, there are maybe a million and then some, but principles are few. And the person who grasps those principles can su successfully select their own methods. And I think that fits very perfectly with how we deal with beekeeping. Um, there's a million and one methods, right? I mean, and we, we know that from all the, the various phrases that we talk about, you know, ask three beekeepers, get 10 different answers, so on and so forth. Um, and ultimately what it boils down to is how we handle the knowledge that we are handed uh, or taught and, and absorb over the years that we, we keep our bees. Uh, and, and ultimately it boils down to the four fundamental principles of beekeeping and uh, was talking about these four principles of about a week ago with Landy and another friend of ours from New Hampshire. And uh, we kind of key in on these, these four fundamentals. And one of those is that every colony must have a young queen of superior genetic stock. And the question becomes what's superior, right? And ultimately it's whatever queen works for you. And we're kind of going to talk a little bit about that later on this evening. Um, number two is every colony must have an adequate supply of honey and pollen, right? We talk about nutrition why those bees do what they do. Um, I was in a bunch of colonies today with our state, uh, one of our state bee inspectors. And here in Western Pennsylvania, at least, we are seeing a lot of up and down temperatures, a lot of wet weather, a lot of cold weather. And we're actually seeing colonies that are starving with lots of brood. We're seeing colonies that have lots of chilled brood, uh, where we're seeing cat brood, uh, open larvae, eggs, in sections where you should see just a, a, a steady uh, progression of age classes. And we're seeing a bunch of age classes missing because of this up and down. But nutrition is important. Uh, we have to maintain them disease free. Um, ultimately, that's impossible anymore because of the number of viruses and diseases that are transmitted by mites and other things that are out there. But we have to manage that. We have to take care of that. And of course, every colony must be in a properly, properly established and a well-constructed hive and protected from extreme climatic condition. What does that mean, right? There's a thousand and one different variety of hives out there. Ultimately, we're not going to keep them in a cardboard box because they're going to perish. But certainly, we want to give them uh, a chance, whether it's through insulated hives, standard Langstroth, whatever it may be. <clears throat> so so why the mayhem, right? And, and the definition of mayhem is, is chaos, right? Just lots of confusion. And ultimately, when it comes to beekeeping, especially now, I've noticed in the last 10 years, uh, at the very least, since colony collapse disorder hit. So what is that, 15 years now? Um, we're seeing too many variables, right? And we're seeing a lot of beekeepers just become confused. Um, and just, they they don't know which way is up. They don't know which way to go. And instead of focusing on one thing, we either try everything but the kitchen sink, or we only try that one thing that somebody told us to try, right? Well, you have to do it this way. You get into your hive, and if you do this, your bees are going to survive. And that's not always the case, as many of us probably have found out um, in one way, shape, or form. <clears throat> we talk about management or the lack of management, right? This hands-off beekeeping uh, or even mismanagement in some cases because we're doing that one thing that that one person told us that doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing for you to do in your particular yard. We also see changes in equipment and bees. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to talk about that a little bit. You've probably heard about the four P's, right? The pests, parasites, pathogens, and poor nutrition. I like to add the fifth P, which is piss poor beekeeping, right? We just, 
we're just not managing our bees. And, and we say that jokingly, tongue in cheek, but in reality, there is. There's some pretty poor beekeeping practices going on out there. And, and it's not to say that my way is right or somebody else's way is right, but there's we're, we're putting two and two together and coming up with five. And, and that's not how it works in the beekeeping world. Uh, we talk about genetics, right? But I bought this type of bee, you know, pick your flavor of the month. It's out there. Well, if I bought this, I was told that this was going to happen and I would get more honey and I would have less mites and my bees are going to overwinter. We're using Southern techniques for Northern climates or, or Northern techniques for Southern climates, whatever the, the, the uh, scenario may be. We're getting contradicting resources, right? But Landy told me I should do this. Well, Somebody else may say something else, right? It doesn't mean that Landy's wrong, but what works for Landy may not work for me. And, and Landy can tell you stories. She and I, get we butt heads every now and then about certain things, uh, whether it's baiting bear fences or using oxalic acid or whatever it may be. But beekeepers are getting contradicting information. They don't know which to believe or who to believe or what to believe. And the reality is that probably we're all right in some way, but it, we're right because of what works in our own yard. Um, beekeeping is black and white, really, right? The problem is there's a very large gray area, and that's kind of the knowledge of beekeeping. I often say in my talks that um, beekeeping is both an art and a science. Uh, the science is the knowledge. We can teach you that. The books that are written can teach you that. There's a lot of good basic biology out there. The art of beekeeping is the application of that knowledge. How do you take what you've learned and apply it to your bee yard? Or how do you take what Landy told you or what I told you or any other uh, beekeeper may tell you? And how do you apply that? That's the gray area. And that's where we often get this chaos, this mayhem, because we don't know which way to go. And we all strive to keep bees the best that we can. But we fail so often, almost 40% of the time, at least here in Pennsylvania, we lose 40% of our bees every year. Um, we struggle with that. And we have this high goal of not killing our bees, not having our bees die and making tons of honey. And we often fail at that. Um, and, and often I ask beekeepers too, are you doing something because you understand why you're doing it? Or are you doing it because someone told you to do it? That uh, my bee meeting last week, I, I asked this question several times because somebody said, well, I did this, this, and this, but my bees died. And I said, well, why did you do this, this, and this? And they didn't know why they were doing it. They were doing it because somebody else told them to do it. So there's all these different things that cause this, this chaos and this mayhem in the beekeeping world. And we have to strive to get away from that and kind of get a, a more very focused um, uh, view on how we're dealing with our bees. So part of this is the changes in the industry, right? How much effort does beekeeping take? And are we really saving the bees? We've heard that mantra been said and written a thousand and one times, you know, save the bees, save the bees. And, and really, are we saving them? Do we need to save them? Those are questions that, that we have. You know, just for comparison, in 1983, um, I was six years old and we kept bees with my, my dad and, and he still keeps bees in the same spot on the farm we put supers on in april we take full supers off in october we catch a few swarms maybe a colony died here and there and we had over three and a half million colonies in the united states fast forward to 2021 40 years later we have to check our bees every 10 to 14 days we have to deal with mites which showed up in 1987 we have inconsistent honey flows we have increased numbers of pests and transmission transmissible diseases we have much higher densities of beekeepers, but we have less colonies. We have 2.7 million colonies, but where those colonies are actually uh, situated are in much uh, denser areas, right? Urban, suburban landscapes. We don't, we used to see them in the rural communities. Now we're seeing them into these, um, I call them urban, urban homesteaders, right? We have bees, we have chickens. We want to see where our food comes from, from that slow move, slow food movement that has uh, slowly grown in popularity. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, that changes how we manage our bees. And of course, I mentioned that 40% loss and those of you that participate in the Be Informed Partnership uh, survey, you know, that just came out, I think, on April 2nd. I encourage you to take part in that. And that gives us some of this information as to what states are losing what population of bees and why and how we're managing them, et cetera. The equipment and bees have changed, right? We tend to reinvent the wheel. We call it modernizing, right? You know, we started off with Lorenzo Langstroth 
hive, his standard Langstroth hive. Then we've converted into Layen's hive and the long Langstroth and the flow hive and back to Skeps and Gums because they're quote unquote natural. The top bar hive, the Warre. Now we have the Ape and Maze, which are that I call them the play school hives because they're, they're plastic, they're insulated, they're expensive. Um, and every week I seem to see a new GoFundMe uh, project on Facebook that for some other new natural hive. And, and some of this is reinventing the wheels. Some of it's uh, a hopeful modernization of beekeeping to make beekeeping easier. Some of it's just marketing. And then of course we talk about the changes in the bees. And, and I always ask myself and, and beekeepers, are the bees changing or are we expecting too much from our bees? What is it real? What is the reality, right? Back in the eighties, there was the midnight and star line uh, bees that Dr. Larry Connor was working on in Florida. We have the Russians, we have the Varroa sensitive hygienic, we have uh, New World Carniolans, we have mite biters, Saskatrass, Poline. Poline have been around for 15 years or so, and they now just recently got enough traction that they are the new cool flavor of the month, right? Everybody's now, I'm already getting emails about these pole lines. Where can I get them? How can I get them? Are they local? Where are they from? Uh, Minnesota hygienic. And of course, we always go back to local, right? Oh, buy you local. Local bees are best. Local bees are best. Are they? That's for you to decide. Um, the northern versus southern debate. Oh, you can't buy queens from Georgia. They just won't survive the northern winters, right? Um, I'm seeing arguments now is overwinter nukes better than spring nukes. You know, well, overwinter nukes, you get a, a, an older queen that's going to swarm probably very quickly versus a young spring queen that's going to just ramp up and build your colony. Uh, all these arguments that are out there, and it really causes a lot of mayhem within the beekeeping world. And where do we go? What's right? And we have to kind of step back and look at those four fundamental principles. You know, the bees itself. And, and I mentioned on the previous slide, are we expecting too much? And, and really, it's are we marketing too much? Are we marketing these as the the bee to have? You know, these pole lines, as I talked about, you know, they're, they've tested them on commercial beekeepers. They like them because they overwinter. They like them because they produce a lot of honey. But we said the same thing about Saskatraz. We said the same thing about Russians. Varroa sensitive hygienic were the queen to have to control mite numbers. And the reality of it is that none of these are the silver bullet. Right. It's how we manage our colonies. Uh, again, that local northern versus southern overwintered versus spring. It's all marketing. Who could sell the most bees the quickest so they sell out? They could wipe their hands clean and be done with it. And instead of telling the truth about the bees or, or learning the truth about these bees, we tend to want to jump to the latest, greatest thing and expect that our bees are going to survive no matter what. I was on a conference, at a conference uh, remotely on Zoom with Chester County Beekeepers in, in Pennsylvania, and uh, Ian Stepler of Manitoba was there as well. And I was moderating a roundtable, and one of the questions I had asked him was, well, what is the best bee? And he kind of chuckled, and he says, well, whichever one survives. And he went on to say that he's actually bought queens from Hawaii and brought them to Manitoba, overwintered very, very well, very successfully, and they're Hawaiian queens. So that kind of blows that whole northern versus southern um, argument out of the water where you have a, a beekeeper in Manitoba, Canada, which gets severe hard winters, and he's overwintering with bees from Hawaii. So lots of things to think about uh, when it comes to all this craziness that's going on. So we have to overcome these challenges uh, to the changes in beekeeping, right? Beekeeping has changed. And the question is, have you? Are you able to adapt with the way the beekeeping um, universe is changing, whether it's the bees, whether it's the equipment, whether it's the knowledge, this new science that we're gaining? And, and you can't argue that we're not. I mean, we're seeing lots of progression in the research, but we also have to remember to go back to some of the basics. Those of you that might read some of the old books, there's some very good knowledge very basic knowledge in there that you don't see mentioned and discussed anymore. Um, beekeepers no longer a hobby. Beekeeping is no longer a hobby, right? We all think of it as a hobby and that's what we get into it. Oh, it's, I thought it'd be fun to do. I want to do this. I want to do that, but it's an investment. It's work. Do you have the time, the money, the patience, the integrity to keep those bees for the next 30 years? You know, Landy and I could talk, talk 
days on end about how tired we are and how worn out we are and how much money we've put into it. Um, we do it partially as a business, um, partially as a quote unquote hobby, but it it's work. Beekeeping is hard. Um, and though those bees are not domesticated, they're not necessarily feral because we are manage them, managing them. It's our responsibility as a beekeeper to be a bee manager, right? We have to manage them in some way. And I'm not saying you have to treat your bees. I'm not saying that you should be treatment free. I'm saying that you need to manage your colony. And that's what we have to get back to. Um, beekeeping becomes a dichotomy uh, in sorts. You know, it's that treatment versus non-treatment dichotomy. And we have to come back to the middle and realize that it doesn't matter whether we treat or not treat, it's, it's how we manage those. And we forget how to manage our bees. And of course, beekeeping is not the same as winning the goldfish at the fair. You don't just go buy bees and put them in your backyard and, and call it a day. Uh, there is a lot more to it. So as we move on to the mishaps in beekeeping, right? the, the New Oxford Dictionary calls it an unla unlucky accident. Uh, and we we do have beekeeping mishaps. I mean, there's lots of things that we do that are just kind of funny. But unfortunately, uh, the mishaps that we do most often are ones because of our reluctance to manage, our reluctance to ask questions or to acknowledge that we don't know everything. Uh, beekeepers these days, often three, four, five years of experience, it's, it's that state of delusion, right? I, I got it figured out and then her bees die and then they're back to square one. And, and some of the things that I often hear um, as far as mishaps, right? My bees were alive last week because they were coming and going from the entrance. And then I opened it up and they were gone. What happened? You know, we've all heard that question or seen those pictures. Um, there was brood in the fall. I, there can't be queenless. Now it's, it's March, it's April. We're supposed to be growing, right? The hopelessly frameless colony. I'm bad at this. This is a true mishap, right? Where I'll put that frame in later or I'll, I'll fill out those five frames later. And sure enough, you come back and the bees fill it out for you. That could be dangerous. It may not be dangerous depending on how you're able to manage your colonies. Um, they couldn't have starved. There was plenty of honey in the supers, right? Poor location. While there was a fence around it, I don't know how whatever got into it. Um, I don't use smoke, right? <laughs> What you're wondering why bees are aggressive or, or sting you or are just pissy in general. Um, I'm okay not getting honey. I just want bees to pollinate, pollinate my garden, right? The whole save the bee type of aspect. So lots of mishaps and, and I'm stretching the, the, the um, definition of that word, but it's these types of things that, that we kind of stumble over as beekeepers. Um, and we have to kind of go back and look at it and say, okay, we need to pay attention, right? So some of the biggest mishaps, you know, poor location, you know, and, and some of you may go, yep, I've seen that. That is bear damage. Should have put a fence around it, Steve. You know, we we could do this and do that. And and this was a mishap that ultimately cost me an entire yard of bees. And, and not because I didn't put a fence around it. It was because of poor communication with the um, the landowner and also because of a whole stubborn herd of these guys. Um, that damage was caused by a flock of sheep who went in and started rubbing on them and flipping things and um, chewing on the wood. And they absolutely destroyed 25 colonies. Um, I was able to say, salvage some of them. I mean, the bees were there, but they just destroyed equipment left and right. Right. And that's a true mishap. It's like, what the heck happened? But we have to pay attention to those types of things. So. But when we talk about more mishaps in terms of survival, and, and I kind of tweaked this talk just a little bit. It was supposed to talk about you know getting your bees through winter and spring, and we're, and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, because that seems to be where we most often lose our footing as beekeepers, right? So winter survival, this seems to be where we have the biggest challenge as beekeepers is keeping our bees alive. And I think, and I'll go full out and say this, that I think it is the biggest challenge that we have next to mites, you know, and everybody's sick about hear hearing about mites. We just, that M word is just like, uh, again, um, but ultimately, yeah, mites are important, but how we handle our bees going into winter and coming out of winter is probably our biggest mishap of all, right? So why is that? Well, we have a fear of killing our bees. If we open the hive, we let the warm air out, right? We often over inspect, but we under manage. We go in without a purpose. What are we looking for? 
do we need to go in there and fully inspect the hive or are we just kind of curious? Um, we have improper winter prep going into the, the fall. We have win improper winter prep as we go from fall into winter. And then even more improper management in late spring. This time of year, we lose a lot of bees because we either don't manage or we mismanage, right? So the M word, right? Mite control. We're not going to talk about mites. Every other talk is about mites. But as we talk about winter prep, you've all heard the phrase that the winter management begins in August, right? And really it begins before that because you have to make sure your colonies are well fed, have the nutrition that they need, their mites under, are under control, and they have the food supply. Last fall here in Pennsylvania, we had a failed goldenrod crop and it caught a lot of beekeepers off guard. They were expecting to go in in November and feel heavy colonies. They didn't check their hives and those double deeps didn't have 80 to 100 pounds. They might have had 30 pounds, 40 pounds of nectar. Um, the, was that queen vigorously laying in the fall? Because that vigorously laying queen equals more winter bees. And winter bees are what gets you through the winter. Well, when you have a fall, a failed fall crop, say that 10 times fast, and you're not paying attention to your bees, your queen slows down much faster. She's not producing the winter bees that she needs to get through the winter, which ultimately leads us to a smaller, potentially smaller cluster um, in the spring. That proper wintering location, are they where they need to be, right? Because uh, I throw this in here because I, I just kind of chuckle every time I see it. You know, I don't test for varroa. I use my magic eyeballs, right? I didn't see mites. I don't have mites. I didn't see them. We all know the answer to that. So going back to the winter prep and, and the proper location, you know, are your bees protected from wind? You know, we, we talk about ventilation, we talk about wrapping and insulation and all these things. And if we remember those, we, we if we remember those four fundamental prin principles, you know, well-fed, good laying queen, a proper box to put them in, so to speak, a proper hive is important, but we also have to take into consideration the winds, the cold, you know, bees can handle cold. <coughs> Excuse me. Bees can handle the cold. They can handle um, full sun. They can handle shade, all that good stuff. But when you don't break the wind, that kind of sucks the energy out of them a little bit faster. So providing good wind breaks, providing the proper winter stores in the proper winter loca location is just the basis of that management skill set that we need to get our bees through the winter. Um, just another picture, ignore the messy yard because it was a, a cleanup in the fall. But, you know, we have this big tree line in the back that it provides a windbreak. They're facing south. They're in full sun. And the way the wind comes at this location, it actually is very um, less windy here than it is just a quarter mile down the road. And this is one of the locations uh, that I have at the Pittsburgh International Airport. Um Another scenario here where we have this bee yard with a nice proper windbreak, right? And giving them those basic, the basic needs is, is the start to getting them through the winter. Our nukes, we all love to overwinter nukes. You know, um, I like to push all of my nukes together. It gives them um, a little bit more shared heat. I put straw, bales of straw and hay around them on the outside uh, as wind breaks. And you just have this nice cluster of warmth and a lot of bees to get through over winter and of course i give them art of, um, emergency feed as needed and you can see on some of these i've got um, the shims that are going into it um, we often talk about ventilation and it, the heat loss in in these certain hives and this is a picture of, of a, a feral colony uh, that you could actually with a FLIR infrared camera you could look into it and you could actually see some of the bee, you know, the heat at the entrance, you could see a couple bees on the outside. This is in the late fall, so it's not quite full winter. Um, but obviously, we know that trees have a bigger R value, a bigger insulative uh, value with the wood than our hives have. But when we talk about um, the, that loss of heat and loss of ventilation and windbreak, this is kind of like the ideal, right? And um, you guys all know John Gott out there in um, your neck of the woods, and, and he does a really nice talk on um, precision beekeeping and insulating hives and, and mimicking these types of cavities. And he's taking into consideration those four fundamentals, right? Providing an adequate box, so to speak, an adequate home for them to live in. 
Um, again, and when we do that, we could see the value of providing windbreaks, providing insulative um, uh, cover, whatever it may be. And you could see the hives on the left compared to the hives on the right with the infrared camera. Uh, here's another picture here. We have a Lysen hive, which is the double deep um, six frame nuke. You can see the heat coming out of the top. Uh, the hive on the right and the left of, of each of that colony is actually dead, um, but the colony in the back is alive. Uh, and here's another you know, overwintered five over five frame nuke uh, that I hadn't been able to move yet. And you can see that cluster very nice and, and high up in the um, into the honey stores. So when we provide these, these natural, or not natural, when we provide the fundamentals, um, we get a good foundation and we build it from there. But then the question becomes, where do we fail? You know, we're, we're doing all these things and our bees still die. So we have to back up and, and look at where we fail to manage. And, and management is the key in all of this. Well, when we talk about late summer and early fall, we talk about nutrition, right? If the bee, if the queen is, is healthy and the bees are healthy, they have plenty of pollen, plenty of nectar coming in. That means that you've got a healthy colony that's going to equal a lot of brood production of those winter bees, right? The big clusters going into the into the fall. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look at overall colony health, right? That large, healthy cluster in the fall. And often this isn't a good indicator um, that the colony is going to survive. But if we have a good, healthy cluster in December, that means we had a lot of winter bees produced. And we're going to have a better chance of coming out of that, that late winter into early spring with a healthier colony. Um, we have to talk about late, late winter management. And in talking to many beekeepers, uh, I get the sense that many beekeepers are afraid to manage colonies. They're, and by manage, I mean taking a look into those colonies, finding out what they need, where what element is missing. Is it a windbreak? Is it insulation? Is it food? Um, it's the most crucial time to those bees, right? Because they have increased uh, brood production late winter into spring. That adds additional stress combined with fluctuating uh, weather systems, you know, cold, wet, rain, hot, cold. It was 65 today, 76 tomorrow here in Pittsburgh. And we're going down to 43 for the next five days after that. So lots of stress on these bees. Um, but when we get into winter, that late winter is often the coldest time, right? January, February, we get the snowstorms, the ice storms, but at that same time, bees are increasing their brood production, which is increasing food consumption. Um, we get that inconsistent weather. And of course, this is usually when the queen starts to fail, if she's going to fail. Um, we have to look at that. What is going on in our colony? Um, just I pulled this picture off of Facebook on the left that says, I'm pretty sure the four cells on the bottom are queens. Most of the frames are honey, no brood, no eggs. I swear there were eggs last week. Can I save this colony? And what we're looking at is a very healthy frame of brood with lots of bees, right? So it's that whole recognition of what we're looking at, recognizing what the bees are doing and what does it mean compared to the colony on the right. Um, this was out of a um, same post, uh, a different picture, uh, but in, in the late fall, the bees were shutting down, but they were in the process of queen failure. And that beekeeper was like, hey, my bees are doing great, this, that, and the other thing. Should I make a split with these queen cells? And it's just that recognition, recognition of those four fundamentals, right? A young, vigorously laying queen that we can progress through that whole year with. And of course, these are two situations where you have a very good queen and the individual didn't recognize it. And we have a queen that was failing, basically superseded, and the person wanted to make a split with them. Again, recognizing that queen colony, you know, what's a poor pattern versus a good pattern? You know, what's hygienic versus uh, just a failing queen or what's parasitic mite syndrome versus a good queen. Is that a good queen, but just it's a high mite load and it needs controlled? These are all questions that we have to ask ourselves. We have to pay attention to winter biology, right? The physiology is very different. They're fatter, they're fuzzier. We see that change in the brood rearing. We see that change in clustering. Um, you know, clustering is important to understand. You know, clustering 
or when you when you go into a colony and looking at that cluster, the cluster is not heating the entire hive, right? It's heating the cluster itself. But we need to understand at what temperature certain things happen so that we can understand when we can go into our hives, when we shouldn't go into our hives, and what activity is, is normal. Um, we look at the failure to manage based on that cluster, right? So we leave on partially filled supers that are half undrawn, half drawn, maybe a smattering of nectar. We leave our queen excluders on, whether it's by accident or on purpose. We don't, we, we fail to put on our mouse guards. Uh, and you think that some of this stuff is pretty basic, but it's also, it's ultimately where we often fail as beekeepers because it's these little things that we don't pay attention to. We're so focused on, you know, getting our bees fed to a certain weight and, and up to speed getting into the fall, we forget all these little things, right? You know, it's too cold to open the hive. So what you end up with is a colony like this where, that are just absolutely starving. The entire cluster is at the top. But if it was too cold to open the hive, we could lose this type of a colony, right? We see this. We see them all up at the inner, up at the um, upper um, opening of the inner cover. You know, what does this mean? Is it, you know, some beekeepers look at this and say, oh, I saw my bees up atop. They're alive. And they close it and they walk away. We have to open up our hives and look at it. Again, you know, understanding the cluster, understanding how the dynamics of that cluster works. You know, ultimately, is it too cold or you just not want to go outside? <laughs> and that's really what it boils down to, right? So this is a, a colony of mine that, that I took a picture of several years ago. It was a perfect example as to why we need to not be afraid to check our bees in the winter. And, and the picture on the left is the infrared camera. And you can see that it's picking up a temperature of about 66 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then on the right, if you look at the actual picture itself, you could see the cluster. But look at all the frost on the outside edge of that of that cluster in the hive itself. It was cold that day. And I can't remember the actual, I think it was in the teens when I actually opened it up and, and took this picture. Um, so the cluster was fine. It was maintaining its temperature, but they were also hungry. Um, this is in a single deep. Um, they were a fairly large cluster, as you can see, and they were consuming a bit of their honey. So I had to put a candy uh, block on there, which is that shim that you see. So we can't be afraid to open up our colonies in fear of what might happen to the bees. Um, the bees can handle themselves. We have to get in, get out, do what we need to do. Um, you know, make sure your mouse guards, the simple things, make sure your mouse guards are installed. Feed your bees. Don't feed the mice and the bees, right? And here's, this is, I'll come, I'll admit it. This was a colony of mine uh, many years ago. Uh, feeding them sugar bricks, very small cluster, barely hanging on, and yet, you know, Mrs. Mouse came up there and uh, she was raising her young as well. I let them both go uh, through the winter. The bees survived. The mice survived. The mice got evacuated or evicted, I should say. Um, one spring rolled around and we did okay. But, you know, it's that failure to manage. I didn't do what I needed to do when I was supposed to do it. Um, what is proper management? Again, going back to those fundamentals, right? Feed when needed, feed appropriately at the right time. Do they need nectar? Do they need pollen, protein, carbohydrates? You know, we often forget when it comes to winter weight, we get all this food on them, 100 pounds, 120 pounds, whatever our magic weight is. But we often forget that they almost need twice that much late in the winter as they increase their brood production, right? A lot of starving colonies happen this time of year. Um, you know, all these different influences on health, you know, the amount of stores, the size of the colony, how we manage our colonies are all playing roles within this. You know, what do we do with our bees? Do we feed them dry sugar? Are we feeding them hard candy, fondant, syrup? You know, pick your food, um, whatever your management style works. Um, you know, pollen feeders. Um, this is a bad picture because it's not the way it sh bees should be fed, but I had two feeders up. The raccoons were getting to them. So I thought, okay, I'll teach the raccoons. I'll put the cinder block on them. So <laughs> this has all been changed since then, but you know, we're providing a need to those bees. They needed or wanted protein at that time of the year. So we gave it to them. All right. Recognizing where we went wrong. You know, what happened? My bees died, you know. And, and somebody's first instinct here is, you know, oh, they starved. Well, yeah, they starved, but, you know, it's look at the small cluster, right? 
And was that small cluster due to queen failure? Was that small cluster due to lack of resources in the fall? Was it might mismanagement? Um, did they starve because they stuck themselves on the brood and wouldn't move to the honey that was just a, an inch or two away? Um, or maybe they had so much brood and bad weather, they just starved completely and it, it happened. Um, this was from a fellow beekeeper here in Pennsylvania in the eastern half of the state just a couple weeks ago. Uh, posted this on Facebook, and I, I snagged them real quick for this talk tonight. That was a massive colony. Look at all that brood that's in there. They starved, completely dry, all because the weather has been so crappy here in Pennsylvania, up and down, just wet and dry. You know, you'd have four days of rain, one day of dry weather takes time for nectar and pollen to come up. He lost an entire colony, a very strong colony, due to starvation because he didn't get food onto them fast enough or recognize that they actually needed. He saw brood, he saw bees, he thought they were okay, and then the next week, boom, they were dead. Whoops. That's you know, again, another picture of a, a dead colony. There's a cluster here. There's a big frame of honey right there. In fact, the rest of those frames were all honey. What happened? You know, the bees died, small cluster, mismanagement. We didn't provide the needs that the colony wanted. You know, and, and this comes from the hive and the honeybee. The failure of beekeepers to provide wintering colonies with sufficient properly organized stores is the principal cause of winter mortality. We could argue that now. Back then, yeah, that was probably the case. But now we need probably need to add the failure of beekeepers to provide mite management, proper nutrition, you know, the four fundamentals, all those basics. Um, but we also need to recognize where we did okay, right? What, when things go well, we remember those things and we tend to repeat them until something goes wrong. And then we don't pay attention to what we did and we start to question everything that we did. Um, but we have to recognize that, you know, if we had the proper food and nutrition, they had proper overwintering clusters, we have that brood early in the spring, that's an exciting time to get into our hives and feel good and pat ourselves on the back. When we open a colony like this in mid-March and there's lots of bees, lots of brood, and lots of stored food, honey left over that they are not starving to death, right? So. The keys to success, you know, to avoid this mishap and mismanagement and the mayhem that goes along with beekeeping is remembering those basic fundamentals, right? Your queens, you know, young, vigorous, something that works in your own yard, adequate stores, healthy bees, quality equipment and location, proper management that I misspelled. I'll point that out. <laughs> Did that wrong. Use those fundamentals as building blocks. Develop good management in your own yard. It doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what Landy does or anybody else. It, demand, it depends on what you do in your own yard and where you get success. Beekeeping is extremely local. Um, pay attention to the resources, right? The art and science I mentioned earlier. We could teach you the knowledge. How you apply that knowledge is the art of beekeeping. That takes many, many years. And we still, to this day, I've been doing this since I was four, you know, so I'm still learning. I'm still changing my practices. I'm still adapting, you know, pay attention to where you get your knowledge. You know, um, is social media really a good source? You know, in 2019, I Googled this top 60 beekeeping blogs and websites for beekeepers. There were 60. <laughs> How many, you know, that's just the top 60. How many are there? You know, we have to overcome some of these challenges. You know, we're not going to save the bees um, just by being beekeepers but we owe it to ourselves. We have to educate ourselves. We have to pay attention to colony management, mite management, proper nutrition. All these things are very important, right? Implement a hive management plan. I'm, I've been doing this. Um, it, it's a great way of paying attention to what happens year to year. Your hive management plan doesn't have to be real complex. It could be simply taking notes, but include strategies that you've dealt with year after year in previous years and what you've changed. The biology stays the same, right? The black and the white doesn't change. That big gray area, that's where we often stumble. You know, so what are the challenges? You know, <laughs> again, what type of beekeeping, chemical free, Darwinian, treatment free, organic, conventional? We just need to get along, right? The goal is to become successful beekeepers, not tell somebody they're right for doing a certain way or wrong for doing another way. Um, just to compare who's right, who's wrong, and and what's you know where we're all at. 
Uh, Dr. Robin Underwood did this study at Penn State comparing survival of colonies in conventional, conventional organic and chemical free systems. And it shows that, you know, if we don't manage our bees, if we don't deal with the bees the way they're supposed to be dealt, we have a lower survival study, uh, survival rate on that. She does it. If you want a good speaker, Robin is a, uh, does a great job um, doing presenting the information on that talk. Um, we're here for instant answer, answers instead of knowledge. We don't want to learn. We want to be told what to do, right? Two Facebook groups on, on Facebook. Beekeeping Questions has almost 13,000 members. Common Sense Beekeeping has 522, right? It's, it, it's an unfortunate um, way we are with society today is that we don't really want to take the time to learn. We just want to be told how to be successful and expect to be successful. So going back to writing that hive management plan, understand who you are as a beekeeper, right? Where do you, what are your goals? What do you want to do? How are you going to manage mites? How are you going to handle queens? Are you going to manage your swarms? How do you handle diseases? You know, the, the new FDA regulations that came out about antibiotics uh, a few years ago. Do you have a vet? Do you want a vet? Do you really care? Are you going to feed? Are you going to not feed? All these things are something to consider when writing your management plan or taking notes on while you're in your hives. You know, your colony management, are you 10 frame, 8 frame, mediums, deeps? Um, what are your goals for inspections? Know what you're looking for before you go in. It goes back to that statement earlier of over inspecting and under managing. We're just going in to go in. We're not paying attention to what we're looking for, nor do we know what we want to look for. Um, how do you deal with those diseases? What kind of equipment are you going to use? How are you going to use that? Paint it, stain it, dip it, all those good things. Um, how do you get rid of excess product? Too much honey. Is there such thing as too much honey? Are you going to wrap? Can you in, uh, overwinter indoors? What about your windbreaks? Um, do you belong to a club? You know, I'm pre preaching to the choir here because you guys are all part of a club, which is fantastic. Do you belong to your local, state, and regional groups? You know, those are important as well. They're the ones that represent you at a state level when it comes to B law and stuff like that. What classes do you take? Um, is this considered a class as a lecture? Possibly. Are you doing um, weekend um, hive tours or whatever it is? You know, there's a B school, all that good stuff. Uh, extend your education a little bit. And then look back at your lessons learned, right? Don't be afraid to try new, th new things. You know, you're going to fail. It, it happens. But you're also going to succeed. You know, asking three beekeepers doesn't always result in 10 correct answers. And you have to be able to... to Take those and, and pick them apart and find out what information is good and what information is bad and understand why you're being told a certain thing versus just being told something to be told something. Um, management's crucial. You know, ask yourself questions, analyze the consequences to those questions. What happens if I do A, B, and C? Is X, Y, and Z going to take place? And if it doesn't, why not? You know, and of course, the biggest thing I think with beekeeping and management and mishaps is don't put off the things tomorrow that need to be done today, right? Don't procrastinate. Oh, I'll put that fence up tomorrow. I'll add the super next week. I'll replace that queen whenever. Cause then you end up with sheep problems, <laughs> eating your hives. You have laying workers, you have swarming, right? There's all those things that we put off because we just didn't get to it and didn't want to get to it. And I'll leave you with two last two things. One is the success of your own operation. It doesn't matter if your bees are alive or dead. It doesn't matter if you harvest honey. Measure success by whether or not you learn something from the bees, the, the lessons that the bees taught, right? Your bees died. It happens. We all make mistakes. Look back at it. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? What are you? What did you do that you're not sure if it was right or wrong? And, and analyze that and figure that out. And I think I'll end the talk tonight um, just with this last quote from George Bernard Shaw that says, the biggest communication problem is that we listen to reply, not to understand. And I think that's very um, poignant when it comes to like Facebook and social media, right? We want to be that person that responds to everything, not to understand the question the person's asking or the question that you're even asking. Um, so take a step back, pay attention to your mishaps, pay attention to your management, um, pay attention to the mayhem, the chaos that occurs in our world. And, and I wish I could have made this talk a little bit more fun, but I think this talk 
is more to kind of just put us back into reality and say, okay, you know what? Yeah, there's a lot that goes on in our industry and it's not always crystal clear, right? It's clear as mud, as, as some people say. Um, so with that, I, Justin, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up. And if there's any questions or, or applause or booze or throwing rotten apples, whatever it may be, um, I'll take it. So I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. I think I'll be speaking to you guys here again in a few weeks or a few months, I guess it would be uh, on single brew chambers. But as always, um, it's, it's good to be able to uh, talk to you guys and, and girls and see what's going on on the other end of, of Pennsylvania. So, hey, Steve, how's it going? Hey, Landy. Did everybody <laughs> leave? <laughs> nice talk. Very interesting. Kind of a almost a philosophical approach. In a way. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. different. It's it's a different talk for sure. It's, you know, the like I said, the goal is to kind of just get people to, to just sit back and kind of reevaluate, you know, because we all get into that – you know, even if we've been keeping bees two or three, four years, we start to get into a rut and, and we start to do things and we, we forget the basics. And it can that can, I think, cause chaos and mismanagement and, and all that good stuff. So we we couldn't completely see all of the slides because oh. um, just because your your picture is in the lower right hand corner. And oh. our screen isn't quite big enough. <laughs> so you got to see my ugly mug instead. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, but, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I see how it is. You should have interrupted me. I would have like hid myself. No, no, I asked Justin. He says there was nothing that we could really do about it. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Justin, for covering. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> we, uh, we'd have to turn you off. We'd have to like eliminate you completely in order to see everything. <laughs> Um, uh -huh. but, uh, but maybe you could, sh you could send Justin the, um, you know, the PowerPoint file and he has it. that way we could look at the slides, which should be nice. Yep. Yeah. He has a PDF of it. So yeah. Do, do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Charlie, hold on. Hold on. You have to have the microphone. Hey, Steve, it's Charlie here. So yes, sir. my question is this, you, you plan ahead, you, you know, you, you, you try to, uh, build up your resources so that uh, your bees make it through the winter, that they have plenty of honey. You check in January to see, and some of them have consumed most of it, so you make your candy board or content or whatever and put it in. You get to this time of year, mm -hmm. and everything is starting to go into bloom. And you see that the resources may be dwindling, and you certainly don't want to use fondant anymore. Where, 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 how do you sort of tell, like, when you have crossed that line where they're able to fend for themselves sure that's actually a very good question and we're we're experiencing that experiencing that now here in, in western pennsylvania because we are not we're in this weird weather pattern here and i'm not sure what you guys that was are what kind of with. triggered the question was when you described that and we're getting sort of some casts of that same weather yeah and it's funny because in philadelphia and dc they're swarming already i mean it's just like what the heck's going on here? Um, I will tell you that what I tell my beekeepers out here is don't go by dates or a calendar. You know, don't say April 1st, I do this. And I, or I guess one of the things we fall back into is we go by calendar beekeeping and we go by the wrong calendar. We go by the one that has all the dates on it instead of by the one that mother nature gives to us on a daily basis. So about a month ago, I had people out here reversing hive bodies. I had somebody make splits two and a half weeks ago. Uh, somebody already tried to raise queens. So to answer your question is, how do you know? I use environmental cues, right? So one of those environmental cues that tells me what's going on, one is, you know, pollen that's coming in. All right. So if I know there's pollen coming in, that's a good thing. I'm not seeing a lot of pollen coming in. Um, we had a cold freeze, which killed a lot of our early maples. Um, now maples bloom across the board, so that's not a bad thing, but we have zero flight weather because of the rain. Uh, so I look at for, forsythia, um, you know, the big yellow bushes that you see in urban suburban areas. Um, when forsythia are blooming, I know that my strong colony should have drone brood, but ultimately what it boils down to with your question is what, what do I what do I look for to say, okay, I'm out of the woods and my out of the woods environmental sign is dandelions. When dandelions are in full bloom oh. all around my neighborhoods, 
that's when I know, okay, yeah, we're going to get a little bit of rough weather, but that rough weather is few and far between. Um, and we're seeing that now. And in fact, I expect the Andy Lions to be blooming here in the next week, week and a half. And then at that point, um, I'll take off my candy board. So my, my bees are doing okay, but I still have candy boards on them. Some of them have sugar syrup. I mean, they have the resources they need because they can't fly to get what they need and they're consuming what they have stored within the colony. So yeah, use environmental signs, you know, and dandelions is kind of my cut, my drop dead date is that if I, my bees make it to dandelions, then they've made it through winter and they're going to survive up until that point. Anything can happen. That's a good question. Hi, uh, it's just Steve. Um, I uh, wanted to know, like, looking in the brood box, I have like several uh, frames of honey, and then the brood. Mm -hmm. What would be enough to, 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 you know, just leave them be, or should I feed them? You know, like, how would you know? Yeah, that's a good question too. So I've looked at I looked at a bunch of colonies today with my state apiary inspector, and um, we saw the same thing. We saw some colonies that had you know, brood two, three, four, five frames of brood, but they still had several frames of honey. Um, those colonies we deemed to be just fine. They were safe. They didn't need to be fed. When you see a colony that has several frames of brood and like in zero honey, um, basically what you'd call a dry colony, those are the ones that you need to feed. I mean, I hear a lot of time from some of the old time beekeepers that say, I just automatically put on feed on whatever such and such a date. Um, I guess that's a good blanket approach, but you're not really managing your bees at that point. You're not in touch with your bees and knowing what's going on. So when you have, if you have full frames of honey and you've got several frames of brood, going through this up and down weather is probably a, not a bad thing for them. They've got the resources they need. If they're stuck at home and the cupboards aren't bare, they're going to be fine. It's those ones that you go in and you see five, six frames of brood and a half a frame of honey or no frames of honey. Those are the ones that are in danger of uh, just collapsing. You saw that picture or part of the picture of, of those frames that, I mean, he had a lot of frames of fully capped brood and the colony just starved on that brood because they had zero honey in the colony and he lost the entire thing, including the brood. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have any more questions from anybody here. Uh, anyone that joined virtually can unmute themselves and ask questions for Steve as well. I think that might no be question. A... Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that that's about it then, Steve. That's it. Awesome. Well, you know, as Landy said, it's more of a philosophical approach for things for sure. But, uh, you know, ho hopefully everybody at least stops to think and look at their hives and think of their management plan and what they're going to do. And, you know, do they know why they're doing it? That's that's the probably takeaway from there. So good luck to everybody. I wish you guys a, uh, a, a good and healthy spring and lots of nectar coming into those supers. And uh, we'll talk to you guys again in a few months, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, guys.